This is the CBS Evening News, Dan Rather reporting. Good evening. The Tower nomination in trouble. President Bush says he still supports John Tower for Defense Secretary. The Senate Armed Services Committee now says it expects to vote next week on whether to recommend, up or down, Tower's confirmation to the full Senate. Still, the accusations about Tower's private life swirl. Similar accusations were made weeks ago by Tower's opponents, some of them right inside the Bush transition team. CBS News White House correspondent Leslie Stahl reports the dump Tower campaign is intensifying. Next week, two influential publications aimed at the military establishment, the Defense News and the Army Times, will call for John Tower to withdraw his name as Secretary of Defense. This is expected to put more pressure on President Bush, who is standing by his man for the Pentagon despite recurring allegations of personal misconduct. In fact, White House officials have been on Capitol Hill today urging senators to support him. Well, I'm, I'm satisfied. I think that uh, I know him uh, well. I know him to be a man of, uh, of uh, great skill, and uh, I believe uh, public uh, integrity, and I don't believe uh, the allegations that, uh, that we've been receiving. Tower spent the entire day in his hotel while the FBI began checking out what White House officials describe as two separate allegations. One involves an alleged liaison in Houston, Texas, with a woman from an Eastern Bloc country, the other focuses on excessive drinking by Tower in public during the past year. High-ranking congressional sources say some senators are worried. If Tower has a drinking problem, it could put him in a compromising position. Oh, I think it's a legitimate thing to look into and a question to ask to make sure that um, it's not a physical problem for him. The problem for President Bush is that he's boxed in. If he were to jettison Tower now, it would make him look weak. George Bush cannot afford to cave in on this. Uh, at this stage in his presidency, early weeks, to cave in would send a signal of weakness, and it would gravely damage him. But the big problem is that the allegations keep coming. Administration sources say the FBI is now widening the investigation to include questioning of this woman, a former member of Tower's arms control team in Geneva, who told CBS News last night of a specific case of Tower's womanizing. If any of the new charges prove damaging, and White House officials believe that so far none have been, the feeling here is that the president does have one out. He can always blame the FBI for a sloppy investigation. Leslie Stahl, CBS News, the White House. President Bush said today that any solution to the savings and loan deregulation, bungling, and corruption mess will be unpopular. He did so amid speculation that one way or another, the solution he proposes next week will wind up costing taxpayers and or depositors billions more for the bailout. CBS News White House correspondent Wyatt Andrews has our report. At Camp David this weekend, George Bush will make the first major policy decision of his presidency, how to pay for a massive bailout of the nation's savings and loans. Today, the president warned the leaders of Congress to expect the worst. And whatever we come up with uh, will not be popular. I expect that whatever you come up with will not be popular, but we've got to get on and get the problem solved. Despite 10 days of controversy, the administration has still not flatly ruled out a fee on savings deposits as part of the plan to pay for the bailout. Congress has warned him he should rule it out. I would suggest to you that that deposit fee is not a live option. They're not going to agree with everything I propose uh, next week. Key sources say Mr. Bush's top option is a $50 billion package, probably including government bonds. To pay the interest on those bonds, he may propose increased premiums for deposit insurance to be paid not by consumers, but directly by savings and loans and banks. The problem, according to industry leaders, is that even the healthy SNLs can't afford it. If you have 73 thrifts out there already that are not showing a profit because of the size of the premium today, if you increase that premium, you're going to aggravate an already serious situation for many of them. Another aggravation. A few banks this week ran ads in local newspapers attempting to exploit the current uncertainty, trying to lure deposits out of savings and loans. The ads angered the White House and added to fears of a run on SNL. There should be no feeling around the country that some solution will do anything to diminish the credit of the United States being behind uh, the deposits. The cost of the bailout is critical because it affects the size of the deficit and literally drives the rest of the first Bush budget. 
In other words, how much money Mr. Bush has to be the education president or to fight a war on drugs depends on this Camp David decision. Wyatt Andrews, CBS News, the White House. White House officials tonight were playing down any appearance that First Lady Barbara Bush disagrees with President Bush's views on guns and gun control. In an interview with wire service reporters today, Mrs. Bush said she did not want to get into politics and policies, but she said military assault rifles, such as the one used to kill five California schoolchildren recently, should be outlawed. Personally, she said, guns scare her, and she doesn't own one because, quote, I'm too afraid I'd shoot the wrong person. Mrs. Bush also said that, unlike her husband, she does not like hunting. Numbing Arctic air today shattered record lows from Oregon to Iowa, closing schools, icing roads, and jamming homeless shelters beyond capacity. Correspondent Frank Courier reports on a stubborn cold wave already linked to 14 deaths. Greetings from Alaska plunged deep to the heart of Texas today, throwing Dallas off balance. As the ice melts and the sand mixes in with it, that area is becoming treacherous. The February freeze and an icy drizzle whipped by a 22 below wind chill left expressways with an inch of ice and motorists with no practice. You drive only two days a year, you don't ever get in practice at it, and it's, it's hard. To... In shivering Sioux Falls, South Dakota, the time and temperature comes with a little frosty commentary. The big chill turned schools into ice boxes, forcing them to close. We had electricity failure, and I don't believe they have electricity back at the elementary school yet. Near Topeka, Kansas, two grain storage tanks burst apart after a dramatic temperature shift of nearly 80 degrees in three days. The quick freeze spewed more than 600,000 bushels of wheat onto the ground. The sub-zero cold wave extends more than 1,000 miles across the north, with record lows deep into Oklahoma, There'll be more of the same tonight in cities like Minneapolis, Denver, and Kansas City. In Indianapolis, on sheer ice, one school bus slammed another from behind this morning, injuring 17 children. In Chicago today, winter dumped up to 12 inches of snow along the lakefront. That's nearly twice the city's average snowfall for all of February. What we're hoping for, and it appears right at this point, is that this coast of the Arctic air will gradually moderate as you into the weekend and early next week, but certainly not going to move out. As Alaska begins warming to near zero, the super freeze in the lower 48 promises to set new and staggering record lows from Oregon to Texas, what forecasters call a cold wave going nowhere fast. Frank Courier, CBS News, Chicago. And still ahead on the Friday CBS Evening News, Harold Dow on a major league breakthrough in baseball. And Bob McNamara on some major league footwork in the jumping capital of the world. We're taking the new road, we're taking the old. Mama and me were traveling in style. Searching for Phil the Groundhog during Philip Sliding's $100,000 Groundhog Day giveaway. If you find him, you could win a lot of cash. But he's not out there. He's in the bulb. <laughs> 34 years of one-man rule ended suddenly and violently today in Paraguay. An army general overthrew President Alfredo Strassner and ordered him out of the country. Hundreds of people reportedly died in street fighting between rebel troops and the presidential guard. Frederick Tice reports from Paraguay. A tank column rolled through the streets of downtown Asuncion this afternoon just as General Andres Rodriguez was about to assume the presidency. Crowds of people converging on the center of the capital cheered the soldiers as liberators. We have waited 34 years for this, said one woman. We feel free now, and we're looking forward to democracy. The citizens of Asuncion gathered in front of a military post next to the overthrown dictator's house to look at the damage caused by heavy fighting Thursday night. The officers' club of the presidential palace was particularly hard hit. Power lines in front of the building were down. Unofficial estimates of the number of dead from last night's fighting range up to 300. General Rodriguez saluted the crowd in front of the presidential palace immediately before and after his swearing in as the new president. He got a warm, though not exuberant, reception from Paraguayans who want to believe that their country is on its way to democracy, but aren't sure Rodriguez will bring that about. Frederick Tice, CBS News, Asuncion. Alfredo Stressner had been the iron-fisted ruler of Paraguay for 34 years. His era ended just as it had begun, with a military coup. The State Department was cautious about appearing to endorse the overthrow. We would welcome any genuine movement 
toward a more democratic form of government in that country. Paraguay under Stressner has been an absolute autocracy, an American ally that even Washington plainly calls a dictatorship. It gained an unsavory reputation as a refuge for foreign despots and fugitive Nazis. Joseph Mengele, the most notorious, a haven for smugglers and drug traffickers, and one of the world's most repressive regimes. Three years ago, 60 Minutes correspondent Mike Wallace asked Stressner about that image. These are lies, enormous lies, big lies. I don't know who could make up such things. I have a healthy mind and a clean soul. You are not a dictator. In no way. Though he made Paraguay an economic showcase, the social cost was high and the strain was clear in recent years as Stressner aged and his opposition grew more outspoken. The economy was better than almost all of Latin America. But what suffered was, was freedom of speech and, and basic human rights. It is a good day to celebrate when Strassner is out. Power formally changed hands this afternoon as General Andres Rodriguez was sworn in as president. Paraguay has now lost its most pervasive personality, but there's a legacy and a memory not easily erased. Richard Roth, CBS News, New York. Dan Cuello was in El Salvador today. The vice president was there to help the U.S.-backed centrist government hold off radical and killing movements of the far left and far right. Juan Vasquez is our man covering El Salvador. The vice president's brief visit was intended to underline the U.S. commitment to El Salvador, a commitment that could quickly become a test of the Bush administration's resolve in Central America. Why I am here today is to reiterate in the strongest terms possible our commitment to democracy and the advancement of human rights. Even as the vice president arrived in the capital, urban guerrillas seized and burned a government vehicle on a major downtown street. The U.S. has pumped more than $3 billion into El Salvador, but it has not been enough to break the bloody deadlock. President Duarte, terminally ill with cancer and near the end of his term, is still hoping for a negotiated solution. Is it possible to destroy and to kill all the guerrillas overnight. I say no, it's not possible. So the military solution is no solution. That's one reason U.S. officials want Duarte's government to seize the opportunity presented by a guerrilla offer to take part in presidential elections, if they can be postponed from March until September. They now recognize after seven or eight years that elections are the way to settle political disputes, not by force of arms. But the military is skeptical. After eight years of fighting and 65,000 Salvadoran deaths, they see it as just another tactic. But the guerrillas say their proposal is earnest. It may be out of shame. We have to start a negotiation. Because elsewhere, everybody is negotiating, and only we, the Salvadoran, are shooting at each other. Late today, President Duarte's party made a key concession to the guerrillas by agreeing in principle to postpone elections if the rebels cease terrorist activities. Some U.S. officials see this development as an indication that the situation here might finally be at a turning point. Juan Vasquez, CBS News, San Salvador. The Princess of Wales ended her visit to New York City today with a mission of mercy. Princess Diana went to Harlem Hospital to visit children dying of AIDS. She touched and talked with the patients in a ward for children who got AIDS from their drug-addicted mothers. the nation's 63rd annual celebration of black history. And history was made today with the announcement that for the first time, an American who happens to be black will head a major professional sports league in this country. Harold Dow has the story. For the first time in its 113-year history, baseball's National League has named a black as its new president. I simply would like to introduce William D. White, the new 13th president of the National League. Thank you. 55-year-old Bill White has been around the game for most of his life. He's a six-time All-Star first baseman with the Giants, Cardinals, and Phillies. And most recently, he shared the New York Yankees broadcasting booth with Phil Rizzuto. After 18 years of broadcasting and saying ground ball is short, throw the first, uh, I think it's time to do something a little bit more definitive. 
but it's the lack of black executives and managers in baseball and other major league sports that has been the source of mounting controversy in recent years. According to the most recent statistics, of the 683 players in the majors, 20% are black. And of the 26 major league managers, one is black. I thought that when I became manager for the first time in, in Cleveland in 1974, that that would open the doors for more minorities in uh, baseball, but it didn't open it that wide. It was just a crack. It's taken so long to get somebody in this position because of racism that exists in Major League Baseball, just like it exists in all other aspects of our society. It's been 42 years since Jackie Robinson broke the color line in Major League Baseball. Jackie Robinson in baseball was the first symbol of racial integration of my lifetime. And so I'm really pleased that baseball is continuing that tradition. It was the unanimous decision of 12 major league owners that made history today. Now minorities both inside and outside of the sport are hoping that this is only the beginning of a brand new ball game. Harold Dow, CBS News, New York. The Atomic Safety and Licensing Board today approved plans by Pennsylvania's Three Mile Island nuclear power plant to boil away 2.3 million gallons of contaminated water, releasing the steam from a smokestack 100 feet high. The Licensing Board insists this steam is no hazard to the public. The government today reported that even as the economy generated 400,000 new jobs last month, the civilian unemployment rate went up one-tenth of one percent. Unemployment now at 5.4% nationally. Analysts said the gain in new jobs may mean the Federal Reserve will hike interest rates to slow down the economy. Fighting on the Israeli-occupied West Bank today. CBS News correspondent Tom Fenton reports the Israelis are now trying to use the military justice system to take rioters off the street, but the tactic has not brought peace any closer. Another day of confrontation on the occupied West Bank. A youth suspected of throwing stones is arrested and introduced to due process of law as the Israeli army applies it to Palestinians. Weeks later, he'll end up in a military court like this one in Gaza, where yesterday, 15-year-old Hadam Kuma got one year in prison, plus one year's probation for rock throwing. The judge says he went easy because Hadam pled guilty. At the same hour, Jewish settler Moshe Levinger was giving the Israeli foreign minister a tour of the West Bank town of Hebron. Rabbi Levinger is also having a brush with Israeli justice. His heavily armed followers sometimes have itchy trigger fingers. Last fall, when his car was hit by stones on these same Hebron streets, Levinger allegedly opened fire with a submachine gun. A Palestinian shopkeeper was shot dead. An investigation has been completed, but no charges have yet been filed. These cases are part of a dual justice system. Israeli military courts this week began handing out heavier sentences of up to five years to Palestinians who throw rocks at Israeli soldiers. Jews who commit crimes against Arabs seem to be judged by another standard. Jewish settler Yisrael Zayev got only three years in jail for shooting dead an Arab shepherd near his settlement. The Supreme Court reviewed this week the case of a Jew convicted of plotting to throw a firebomb into a hut where Arab workers were sleeping and then locked them in. The court increased his sentence from three months to 18 months. Any justice system and laws is not a question of mathematics. You cannot weigh those uh, punishments or sentences against other uh, sentences. You must stop thinking about this as a judicial system. You must really view it as another means at the disposal of the military government to punish the population. But the Israelis are finding that punishment, even heavy-handed, is not working. Mrs. Alaja Rami's 15-year-old son got a two-year sentence this week for throwing rocks at soldiers. She says now she'll be the one throwing the stones. Tom Fenton, CBS News, Gaza. John Cassavetes, actor and director whose movies included Faces and A Woman Under the Influence, died of natural causes today in Los Angeles. John Cassavetes was 59. Week we've been telling you about this erratic winter. Well, if the weather has you at the end of your rope, just skip it. Bob McNamara found a town where they do exactly that. Northern Wisconsin and another long winter 
settles in the lap of the Chippewa Valley. But with it comes that sound again. It is rope jumping time in Bloomer, Wisconsin, and on sidewalks, in schoolhouse hallways, for at least a day every winter, Little Bloomer is the world's jumpiest town. You go out on this floor and you stand in the exact middle of the floor and everybody's staring at you because you're the only one out there and you start jumping rope, your heart makes you jump really fast. <laughs> Not just another little town's way of skipping through winter, this is the World Rope Jumping Championship. Even faster than you can tap a finger on a table in 10 seconds, kids jump a rope 50 or often more times. 54. For the kids, jumping styles are as different as their clothes. Some in socks, some in bare feet, whatever works. But for all of them, it's a big night in a little life. Last night I was nervous all night, but I couldn't get to sleep. I was up all night almost. The coping with a loss. For parents, too, the competition racks nerves. I'm scared for them. I, I think I'm probably more scared than they are. My hands sweat, my I'm nervous for them. Jumping a rope as many times as you can in 10 seconds is faced a lot of ways. Tracy Lynn's tongue comes out. Kristen Imhoff's eyes brighten. Shane Sorg sours, so does Corey Morning. But Megan Rothko doesn't look at all. And Megan Olson? I don't really think of anything. I just think of just trying to jump over the rope. Just trying to jump over a rope was all Paul Morning ever did. And his record of 72 has stood for years. In fact, there's so many trophies in the Morning farmhouse, there's no room for them all. We don't practice all year long or nothing. I don't, I don't know. It must be just something in our blood, I guess. We just go. This year, just when Lance Corneth was pumped and psyched about the 61 jumps he'd done for the Grand Championship, only Gina Hillcoat, hunched over in a blur, was left to challenge. It would be close. 62. Not even Super Bowl or World Series earnings could buy a smile like this. Bob McNamara, CBS News, Bloomer, Wisconsin. And that's tonight's CBS Evening News. Dan Rather. Bob Schieffer will be here tomorrow, and I'll see you again Monday. Good night, everybody. This is CBS. Hi, I'm...